Hi. Thank you. OK, quick poll of the room. How many of you have ever seen a movie called Desperately Seeking Susan? All right. This is my kind of crowd. All right. For the folks who have not, quick refresher. Most people think of this movie as starring Madonna. It is not actually starring Madonna. It's starring Rosanna Arquette. Madonna's in it. Susan Seidelman, 1985. Uh, it's about a couple who interface, meet up, by leaving ads for one another in um, a sort of thinly fictionalized version of the back page of the Village Voice. Right? So the, the guy rolls into town and he puts in an ad and says, desperately seeking Susan, says where he'll be, they meet on a pier. Right, Roseanne Arquette is sort of at a distance watching this board from her house in New Jersey. Some kind of mixed, mixed up uh, identity thing happens. Shenanigans ensue, right? So that's desperately seeking Susan. The current version of the back page of the Village Voice, right, is the misconnections feed on Craigslist. Right? You know what I'm talking about? Right? So like if you've ever done that, I don't know if you've ever done this, but you know, this is this is where you have a romantic encounter with someone. And you, and, you, and you mess it up, right? You don't get their name, or you don't get their phone number, or something. And, you know, and so then you leave an ad on Craigslist, and you were like, you know, oh, man, I met you at this Wharton conference. <laughs> right? You were wearing, you're wearing green. I couldn't keep my eyes off you. Please call me, right? Something like that, right? So I have a theory that, um, that uh, people actually do this exercise and then somehow make a second-order missed connection, which is to say that I would leave the ad about the person in the green dress, and she would leave the ad about me. And then we would forget to check. So we miss each other again, right? So at night, I run this little program on my computer that downloads all the misconnections from your city, compares all the ads against one another, and looks at the words they have in common to try to figure out if these people are talking about each other, and estimates the percentage chance that they are, right? Um, so words like the and of and from don't really matter, but words like green and blue or a place or a name really do. And if the percentage chance gets above, you know, 85%, it emails them and puts them in touch. This is like a little Cupid thing I do. Um, <laughs> right? And this is what I do for a living. I'm an artist, um, but a kind of weird one. Um, so instead of, uh, instead of, you know, making oil paintings, I work with computational technology, right? So I work with computers and electricity to do things like this. Um, we are often told that data um, is impersonal, and so, or can be impersonal, that this is a real risk with the work that um, I think all of you engage in, the work that we engage in, all that kind of stuff, that it's very easy to, um, you know, kind of lose sight of the fact that, that the people are really at the center of the story here. So a lot of the work I do is centered around data storytelling, and a lot of the work I do is around trying to make um, information have emotional resonance, right? And uh, that's something that a lot of people struggle with. And, and, and one thing I always sort of start with is a, a place where that might begin, which is um, something like, let's see, something like music. Right? Music, if you actually think about it, is a, a working definition of music might be, um, you know, using, using data and algorithms to manipulate how you feel, right? If you take sound off the table for a minute, that's actually what music is, right? Notes and chords and keys, right? They're data, right? They're data and they're systems. And I was trained as a musician. And I'll show you some of the stuff I used to do. So this is, if we turn this up a little bit, this is a piece of mine oh, from 2003. This is a guitarist controlling that little blob on the screen and it's drawing. And it's drawing based on what the guitarist plays, the notes that the guitarist plays. So different pitches might mean change color or turn left or turn right. If you're a computer geek, this is something called Turtle Graphics. It's a guy named Seymour Papert uh, who passed away this year, sort of developed this. If the guitarist plays it perfectly, um, fast forward, you get a plant. If the guitarist makes a mistake, you, you get a different plant, right? That's like a mutation. It's okay, that's how we got here, it's fine. Um, right, and so um, you hear these patterns. And those are like the musical equivalent of like the sort of graphical primitive of this plant, like the simplest thing in the plant. Um, and once you know how to like kind of compose with media, kind of work with this stuff in this kind of way, computationally, you can do some fun stuff. So I'm just gonna show you a few projects of mine. Um, this is a piece I did uh, for the Sundance Film Festival. 
back in 2006. This is an unwatchable film. You take every Academy Award Best Picture, you speed it up to one minute, you string them all together. Right, so 75 movies in 75 minutes. Um, I'm showing you two sections of it side by side. It's usually shown as a one, one long film. So you got Casablanca on the left, you got Chicago on the right. These movies are the same duration, so when they're sped up, they're sped up the same amount. But it's easier to understand what's going on in Casablanca than Chicago. And so what this piece shows is it shows you the history of editing. Right? The average length of a cinematic shot in the 1940s was around 30 seconds. Now it's around six seconds, right? We've, we've, we've adapted our culture to develop this kind of pacing of our society. Um, and the films reflect that. This is a portrait that I did um, back in 2010. It has an earlier origin. In 2002, um, the, um, the Defense Department of the United States, essentially DARPA, put out a, put out a big design challenge or, or software engineering challenge for anybody who could figure out how to find a specific individual in a bunch of um, undifferentiated video, right? Imagine who they were looking for then. And, uh, and so I decided to implement the algorithm that won on the one person you would never need to find that way, which is Britney Spears. So I downloaded 5,000 paparazzi photos of Britney Spears and, and, figured, and taught my computer to find her and only her. Right, so I can run any video footage of her through it and it, and it will find her face and lock her eyes in place. Uh, this is a project that I did, God, this is 10 years old now, wow, um, with um, uh, my buddy Leon Amaris Cifuentes, who's up there. Um, she's a performance artist. Really easy to describe what's going on, really hard to do. Um, she spent, or we all spent three days on a traffic island in New York City, 72 hours during which she did 72 minutes worth of action in slow motion. So she took an hour and 12 minutes of getting ready for a date, getting ready for the night out, right, and just did it as slowly and repetitively as possible. We filmed it all and then sped it back up, right? So it looks like she's moving more normally and everything else is flying by. It takes her four hours to do her nails on one hand. It takes her 16 hours to pick out a dress. This is an unwatchable performance. Nobody watched all 72 hours of it except me because right, I was directing the film. Um, but what it shows is, is it shows how these media technologies can be used to give you a 30,000 foot view of a phenomenon right, that you can't quite capture. Uh, this is a piece that does the opposite. This is a four minute piece of music that I wrote, filmed at high speed, filmed at 240 frames a second. So four minute piece of music becomes 40 minutes. And so some things happen, like the, you can see the strings vibrate on the violins down there. The space it, I shot it in was my apartment, but it somehow sounds like a church because when you slow things down like that, all the echoes become a lot broader, right? And if you're a musician in the room, like, like vibrato, that thing where you go, ah, right, becomes microtonal. You hear it go, wah, wah. and it's a way to make a portrait of a musician, right? And that's what these things are. They're portraits. And when you think about portraits, you usually think about oil paintings of, you know, Men heroically standing with stuff around them. <laughs> right, so this is a man heroically standing with some stuff around them. This is George Washington. Um, there's a rainbow out the window. There's a sword, but it's in his left hand. So he's a man at peace. There's a quill on the table, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is my portrait of George Washington, um, which was commissioned in 2008 for the Democratic National Convention. What you're seeing here is an eye chart and what these are is these are the 66 words in George Washington's State of the Union addresses that he used more than any other president. Um, so this is a portrait of him just as the painting was. It just gives you a different insight into the symbolism and what's going on. This is a portrait of George W. Bush, who was president at the time I made this piece. The word he used more than any other president in his speeches was terror. Um, some of these you can sort of figure out. Ronald Reagan has deficits. Uh, Bill Clinton spent most of his time talking about the century in which he would no longer be president. Lyndon Johnson gave the first speeches on primetime television, so he began every paragraph with the word tonight. And Richard Nixon's speechwriter was a guy named William Sapphire, who was an amateur linguist, and he counted words. So he paid a lot of attention to the rhetoric of his boss. If you look at the period around the Civil War, you can sort of see that this becomes a history lesson through the rhetoric of the American presidency. Um, these things are done as big light boxes, and they're to scale. So if you stand 20 feet back and you can read that line, you got 20-20 vision. 
It's good that they're useful. This is actually in Philadelphia. This is actually in Philadelphia at the National Constitution Center. This is where they were premiered, right, um, during the election. So that's cool, right? That's a cool portrait. Um, but it's not a particularly democratic one because it's about the presidency. So I started hunting around for a data set that um, was more democratic. And, and I did this in 2010, around the same time we, were, we acquired the US Census. We did the US Census. And I started looking for a bunch of data of us describing ourselves. And so what I decided to do um, was work with online dating. And uh, so what happened, long story short, I, I joined 21 online dating services. Um, as a straight man, a gay man, a straight woman, a gay woman in every zip code in America, and downloaded about 19 million people about 20% of the adult single population in the United States. Stuck it on a hard drive and did some uh, word analysis. So uh, you can make maps, right? This is where all the lonely people are, right? So this is showing you that Appalachia is pretty lonely. Um, this is showing you where all the funny people are, right? Nebraska is not funny at all. <laughs> um, this is an important map. This is a kinky map. So what this is telling you is that um, women in Alaska need to get together with men in, the southern, in southern New Mexico and have a good time, right? That's what this means. And I have this, I have this at a pretty granular level, right? So like if you live, you know, so it's like men in the eastern half of Long Island are way more interested in being spanked than men in the western half of Long Island. I have this whole thing like down to a T, right? And then I made maps, right? And I replaced all the names of the cities with the word people use more in that city than anywhere else, right? So if you've ever dated anyone from Seattle, this makes perfect sense. Right, we got heartbreak, we got pretty. What else? Oh, I got a laser point, right? We got gig, right? They play in a band, right? They always fucking smoke, right? So you get the idea, right? I mean, this, this all kind of works out. And some of these you can sort of guess, right? So like um, Los Angeles is acting, San Francisco is gay. If you look at some cities, right? We got Houston is rich. For some reason, the words around Atlanta are coca, god, company, jazz, and Protestant. Um, Nashville's recording, Denver's light. Madison, Wisconsin is pierced, right? And Miami's Latino, right? Um, folks in uh, Baton Rouge talk about being curvy. Folks downstream in New Orleans still talk about the flood. And folks in our nation's capital say they're interesting. <laughs> um, I grew up somewhere between annoying and cynical in New Jersey. Um, New York City's number one word is now, as in now I'm working as a waiter, but actually I'm an actor, right? And if you go upstate, you know, Syracuse, New York is dinosaur. That's because the number one place to eat in Syracuse, New York, is a Hells Angels barbecue joint called Dinosaur Barbecue. So that's where you take somebody on a date. If you go down to the zip code level, I live somewhere between unconditional and midsummer in Manhattan. And this is gentrified North Brooklyn. So you've got all the words like DJ and glamorous and urbane. So that's like a, maybe a more democratic one. I've also made more personal ones. So this is a self-portrait I made that's all based on my email. This is everybody I've ever talked to. Um, arranged as sort of a physics equation with the names hand drawn, showing how they relate to me by how much we've spoken and what kind of things we've said. And some of these things are not always as, you know, kind of lighthearted. So this is a Walter PPK 9mm semi automatic handgun that was used in a shooting in the French Quarter in New Orleans three years ago on Valentine's Day in an argument over parking in front of this house, which I happened to be Airbnb at the time. Um, and so what I did was, um, I made a mechanism, this is a bike chain on a camshaft that could be activated by a computer. You stick all that stuff in a box underneath the gun with a wire running through, and you put the computer online so that um, it's listening to the 911 feed of the police department, <laughs> so that anytime anyone's shot in the city, it fires, right? Um, so what happens is there's a blank, so there's no bullet, but there's a cartridge. And so what happens is if there's five shootings a day, it fills up with bullets, right? And this is the problem that I addressed, talked about at the very beginning, right? That, you know, um, data visualization can be anesthetizing if you do it wrong, right? And um, it's something to be careful of because, you know, somebody might treat you like a number someday and you, you won't like it. So um, to finish this off, these are, um, this is a project I did in Times Square last summer. Uh, I started out trying to make a film portrait of Times Square. I went there with a whole camera crew and realized I didn't actually need any cameras because everyone was taking selfies. Um, Times Square is the most Instagrammed place on earth. There's about, uh, a selfie is committed about every five seconds. There's about 17,000 a day. I have them all. Um, and that's how you get back to, you know, the people in your analytics, right? Thinking about the storytelling and thinking about what are they doing and what are they showing and where are they coming from. So.
Thank you for your time.